Hello, today is going to be a teardown time. This is going to be a difficult and messy one. Time to tear this little adapter to bits to see what makes it tick and if there's anything unique about it. Yes, I know the 65 watt IKEA is out and yes, two of them are on the way for both testing and tearing down. The transformer, chips, and any interesting features of this power adapter will be explored. It's still just a normal USB power adapter, but they did do a few things worth looking at. I'll look at and identify the major components of the power supply. I'm curious about the DC leakage and what component choices they made to do that. Also, who made this thing? There's usually clues inside. Oh, Google image search. Maybe it'll get better someday. Focus so much on the PCB being green, it just couldn't get it. But I knew what it was. But using words to describe the logo got it first result. It's on the case who made it. But, you know, let's do things the hard way. In this teardown series, I like to open up electric devices to find out what makes them work and what's inside. The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The components will be identified and analyzed as well as some of the safety aspects. There's plenty of speculation and questions on why some of the things are done as well. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Special thanks to my patrons and channel supporters for making this possible. Click all the buttons. Links in the description. So before I get too into the teardown, I want to go over the specifications of this adapter. This adapter is one of the very few that offer the newer AVS or adjustable voltage supply, specifically within the standard power range or SPR, as well as offering the dynamic power supply settings. These are a bunch of buzzwords and all the latest and greatest in the USB power delivery specification, PD, version 3.2 plus addendum. This adapter has the obvious limitation of being able to put out 67 watts on one USB port. It can dynamically adjust between the two ports, but it's more like steps. The second port loses quite a bit of capability once you ask for more on the first port. There's details of this on the first video linked in the description. The adapter has basic specifications you'd expect for a higher quality adapter. The adapter is fairly high efficiency and very low idle power consumption. In general, this means that it meets the energy efficiency standards with plenty of breathing room, regardless of where you use it in the world. The isolation was one of the interesting parts of this adapter, and I knew what it was, but figured it might be interesting to tear it down and see it physically. If you look at it compared with the competition, it's still good, but it has some DC component to the leakage. So we'll be investigating that in the teardown. The back part of this adapter came apart fairly easily, but I knew in getting the actual PCB to slide out there was going to be some difficulty. They potted the adapter into the case with some gray thermal adhesive. Thankfully this isn't too tough and it peels away relatively easily. The issue is it's in everything and filled right around the case. So it's going to take some work to pry this thing out. In looking at the amount of fill there is in this adapter, it makes sense the way the thermal image showed that the backside of the adapter, where it plugs into the wall, didn't get that hot. There was no thermal adhesive in this area. I know I'm going to damage a few of the components in the process of getting this apart. Definitely a 0 out of 10 for repairability. This doesn't come apart and go back together, ever. Okay, finally got this glue ball out of the case. Time to start stabbing away the glue. More glue, so much glue. Oh, that's good. Once you get it open, there's more glue of a different type, white glue. The adapter itself is shielded. There's a metal band that wraps around the entire adapter. This is connected to one of the AC pins of the adapter. This also has a fairly copious amount of 3M tape wrapped around all parts of it for any areas where it may get close to any components. Okay, please hold while I shred all the bits to get a closer look at things. Okay, this part of the video is going to be a bit of a slideshow since it's easier to go over these one piece at a time with a single shot of the relevant thing. There are a few printed circuit boards or PCBs in this power adapter. The primary board does the main switching and houses the larger components. Then this has a separate PCB for the bridge rectifiers, two of them, that's unique. More analysis on that in a bit. This also has a separate PCB for dealing with the USB side. This I've seen many times. Time to do some general analysis of the main components and see what's what. The first side of the circuit board has some basic components. The output board would be located on the top. There are two smaller output filter capacitors here. These are solid conductive polymer capacitors. Next is the transformer, which we're going to dig into detail later on. Next is the small PCB where the bridge rectifiers are. These contain capacitors on the backside, 220 nanofarads each. 
The other side is all of the main filter components for the AC side. This is where the bridge rectifier PCB is installed. Then the USB circuit board is on the bottom, actually installed on the top. This has the physical USB-C ports and some of the filtering components for the buck output power supply. Of course, there is an input fuse, but I don't see any inrush circuitry or any over voltage protection. I guess they are relying on those inductors to handle transients. The bridge rectifier will clamp a transient at 1000 volts peak at least. What do you think? Leave it below. Flipping these boards over, we can see a whole lot more. The primary controller, in this case a GANSense integrated controller, this is where most of the work happens. Here is a basic datasheet for this and a quick block diagram of the typical circuit. This follows this layout, but obviously has many more support components added in as needed. Not mentioned is a chip to discharge the primary capacitor. On the opposite side of the circuit board where these are isolated, all of the usual suspects are there like a synchronous rectifier and so on. Okay, time to identify a few things in detail. These are the basic components with some identifications or whatever identification I could read from the chips. Pause the video if you want to read through these in detail. The first set here is the input side and the primary switching components. The big thing here is that Navitas GANSense NV9580 chip, which is crazy how integrated things have become. This chip has a ton of functionality and really is crucial to decreasing size and increasing performance of some of these adapters. This power adapter has two bridge rectifiers. Why is this needed on such a small power adapter? Well, here I'm going to offer some conjecture. I did an example simulation of a single versus a double bridge rectifier, inclusive of the approximate load the power adapter would present to the rectifier as well as the primary capacitance. The main thing is the rectifier see a sharp, fast, high current spike, which they would be able to handle, but if you use two in parallel, in this case opposite phase wired, not that it matters, they will share the current. I purposefully used two different diodes here to show that the current sharing won't be perfectly even, but the load on one of each of the two rectifiers is less than the single rectifier. So the thermal dissipation will be essentially half for each rectifier. It also makes no improvement to efficiency or output voltage. There is no inrush protection in this power adapter either, so these two bridge rectifiers may also help with handling the initial inrush if this happens to get plugged in at the peak of mains voltage. The 120 microfarad primary cap is only one inductor away from the bridge rectifier, so things can move really fast. Next on the parts list is the transformer and various components for isolation. This uses a very standard optical isolator between the mains and secondary side for feedback control. The interesting thing is the way the suppression capacitors and the resistors across them are set up. There are five resistors in series across the mains to the secondary side. These were measurable with the isolation tester as a 51 mega ohm resistor. The actual construction here is a bunch of 10 mega ohm resistors in series because each resistor can't handle that much voltage without being damaged or arcing. The capacitors, which are in ceramic looking packages, are made with four total capacitors as a two in series, two in parallel configuration. So you get the same value as one capacitor, but again, you get more suppression voltage with two in series. I did notice that these were never mounted on the same plane, so maybe some bending mode prevention here because the PCB is very thin and certainly could be subject to some bending modes, which are the enemy of these ceramic capacitors. The transformer in this power adapter is very complex, and yes, I'm going to open it with brute force. No one has time for heat guns. It is more complicated than peeling an onion, and I think it has more layers. They are split primary, auxiliary, and secondary windings wound in alternating layers while also being shielded. In every case, the isolation is taken very seriously. Where the wires come in and out, there are extra layers multiple around pins to make sure things don't come in contact with each other. This is really above and beyond and excellent construction. The risk of this being the part that fails, even if it's really hot, are low because they took extra care constructing this transformer. Even with all these closely wrapped layers, the leakage capacitance is still very low, estimated at about 350 picofarads based on the known resistor and capacitor values and the measured leakage current. Of course, it does change a little with voltage. 
The core of the transformer does have a gap in the center. They have a little spongy adhesive in the middle that fills this space, so it's not just air. Not sure if this is just functional for any possible vibration, or if it's a special material that helps with the transformer in storing more energy. Yes, this transformer stores energy. That is the way a flyback power supply functions, and that gap is critical to energy storage. Finally, the USB output side of this power supply is quite complex as well. The circuit board has a lot going on. It has two full power converters, the USB protocol chip, current measurement, and multiple layers of switching the outputs, with a MOSFET on both the high and low side of the output. It's amazing how much tech they squeeze into this tiny space, and really, this is where all the innovation happened in terms of the new modes of operation. The protocol chip is what decides how much voltage these converter chips need to output, and the MOSFETs are switches that decide if the port should be on or off. The main control chip doesn't really seem to advertise much, but it does at least come up with something on the internet. The little buck control chips, which actually convert the output voltage for each USB port, are from Texas Instruments and are made to work with power delivery controllers. So that's what I got out of this teardown. Let me know if you saw anything interesting that I missed. I did have a few questions on some of the components in terms of the function or sizing, so if you know it, leave it in the comments. This little power adapter has hundreds of components and a whole lot of logic and protection devices to make it into a finished product. This adapter is of good quality in terms of the attention paid to meeting the standards of safety, EMI, and isolation. For the price point, this major player adapter is at the top of the market, with many other adapters that perform very well in both in terms of safety and as well as perceived longevity, I mean Apple. I don't think there is a question about selling at a loss. I think they're definitely making money on these and so is Delta Electronics. The price point on these is almost assuredly pushing people to the competition. The adapter uses mostly branded components that I was able to get data sheets or at least find their existence of online. So that's not bad. Some of the components are a bit cheap. Notably, the capacitors are caps on, which is okay. They are cheap, but they are fine. They are just fine. It does get very hot inside this adapter, so the lifespan is always the concern, but there is so much buffer in that primary capacitor, I'd expect a very long life out of it, even if it is hot. Here's the difference. The auxiliary capacitor is ceramic, so the part that will dry out first will never dry out. The indication of this drying out is when the power supply hiccups, but it's gonna take a very long time to see that here, and that will be if this is under very stressful conditions. The unique features are the GANSense integrated circuit, the dual bridge rectifiers, the link of resistors adding a DC component to the leakage, and the collection of four capacitors for the EMI control, along with the shielded and very complex wound transformer. In this case, the capacitors are a minimal concern. The adapter does have good quality construction, good components, and the main thing to complain about is the price. It's still expensive. And for that price, it looks basically the same as any Apple adapter, which somehow are cheaper than this one. I'm planning a video on watch chargers, probably a short one, but wow, Google and Samsung overcharge for that little puck. Apple, again, being the reasonable price option for accessories. When did that happen? So this charger has a few more features in terms of the modes of operation, but it really doesn't do anything special. It's another charger. Very standard form factor, it uses the branded off-the-shelf switching chip, which is all good. It has the requisite components to meet all the requirements of safety listings and the major brand name of Delta Electronics behind it. So it's probably going to last. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Goodbye.